and I've been pushing like an hour every time I've done this. So, um, my name is Lizzie Slavinsky. I'm a Web GIS specialist at ASFPM, and for the next hour, I'm going to be talking to you about perhaps thinking before you code and some other UX considerations you might want to integrate into your development <coughs> process. If you've never heard of us before, ASFPM is the Association of State Floodplain Managers, and we're a national nonprofit and member organization that is dedicated to reducing flood damages. We're based out of Madison, Wisconsin, but we also have 35 state and regional chapters across the country. Together, we all work together to promote responsible management policies for our floodplains. We also promote education and training. We are the certification body for CFMs, or Certified Floodplain Managers, of whom there are 5,000 nationwide. Um, we also support those CFMs by doing research and by gathering data to help them be more effective in their jobs. And that's kind of how my department, Science Services, fits into the mix. So the plan for today is First, to talk about some very basic fundamentals of UX, which is user experience. And then we're going to use those as a framework to talk about a project I was recently involved, with, involved in, where we made this tool called the Toledo Flood Hazard Visualizer. This was quite the segue, if you were here for the last talk. Um, so I'm going to start by giving you a project overview, and then I'm going to actually step you through our interface development process project process and um, give you a couple demos and then we'll finish up with some lessons learned. So first, to start out, UX, as I already mentioned, stands for user experience. And this is really this all-encompassing term that describes exactly the sum of how your user felt in every interaction that they had with you and your product. And that can go from everything from how a product felt when they held it in their hand, to how it functioned, to how it looked, how they feel about you as a person can factor into this. Um, and then there's also this idea of user experience design or user experience engineering, which is basically we should develop and in a way with, that is strategic to in order to allow people to have good experiences when they deal with our products. So one key aspect of UX is usability. Um, no one is going to have a good experience using something if they can't figure out how it works. So usability is the ease in learning or using a product or the degree to which it's user friendly. And it's really important to note how usability is different from utility or functionality because it doesn't matter that your code functions because it has to function for the user. So generally speaking, the more you're able to accomplish with your code and in a sense how your utility increases, that's actually gonna have an inverse relationship with your usability because your application is gonna become more complicated and harder for people to catch on to what's going on. But it really doesn't have to be that way because if we design strategically, we can build intuitive, logical interfaces that make sense automatically when people look at them or are easily made sense of. And that comes with our UI or our user interface. Um, as you know, probably, <laughs> your UI is where your user interacts with your application, but this is much more than just that block of HTML code. It's the framework that is behind that code, as well as what we should really think of it as is this point of contact between us and our consumers or our users. Um, and really, in order to facilitate good interaction across this point of conduct or contact, we really need to take into consideration the way we, us and our users, see things differently. So if you're looking at your application, it's easy to understand how the three parts, your data, your logic, and then your user interface relate to each other. But when your user sees it, all they see is your user interface and magic. They are utterly clueless. <laughs> um, so when we're thinking about our development strategy, it doesn't really make sense anymore to take this old school data-centric approach to 
First I take my data, and then I'm going to build the logic I want to do the things that I want it to do. And then, you know, when you have about, what, two weeks left in your project budget, you start building your user interface because it'll be easy, right? It's just HTML and CSS. This leads to very frustrated people who don't know what's going on. So instead, we should first think about our users and what will work for them, what's intuitive, and then build our application in a way that actually exposes this logic to them. And that way we do this is through user-centered design. And so this depth diagram ten is an attempt to display how user-centered design works. And it's been drawn a million different ways, and there's been a million different of these labels for the sub-steps. But really, the key to this process is that each sub-step is iterative. You do it until you attain some goal that you're looking to achieve. And then the entire process is cyclical. So you do this whole thing over and over until your user is successful. Um, not when they're happy or you run out of money, hopefully, but um, when you really feel like they're going to be successful in the application that you have created for them. So this is the framework I'm going to be using to move through how we developed the Toledo Flood Hazard Visualizer. But first, I want to give you a little bit of background on the project itself. So back in 2012, NOAA Coastal Services Center, ASFPM, the Army Corps of Engineers, Eastern Research Group, American Rivers, City of Toledo, as well as the City of Duluth got together to do this economic assessment of green infrastructure. And what they were hoping to do here is to me measure the return on investment that they could have or would be achieved through implementing green infrastructure strategies. And they wanted to measure this return on investment in terms of green infrastructure's ability to mitigate flood damages. Let's digress for a second. Um, so green infrastructure is easiest when defined in terms of how it's different from gray infrastructure. And they're not just different because they're different colors. Gray infrastructure returns er, refers to um, traditional building practices that um, tend to have impervious surfaces and they increase runoff. Basically, we have vast expanses of concrete and the water can't go anywhere when it rains. So it all either floods to a low spot or goes through a storm, storm sewer and gets, winds up in a catchment basement or something like that. So the area where this water ends up not only is going to wind up more polluted because it's collecting everything that was on that cement surface. It's also going to have a tendency to flood because it can only infiltrate water back into the, the soil and the water table so fast. So the idea with green infrastructure is to use permeable building, permeable building um, practices and in increase the infiltration into the soil so we can store water instead of just moving it away. Um, and Toledo, Ohio was interested in implementing things like this because as you can see, it floods sometimes. In fact, it floods quite a bit. Um, between 1996 and 2009, there were over 35 flood events that were reported. But the bigger picture is this low level or nuisance flooding that takes place after basically any rain event in the city. So this map shows calls to the city complaining about water in homes or businesses or in the street blocking traffic, something like that. There are 10,000 dots on this map and each one represents a complaint. And these complaints were only over the course of three years. So they have a problem on their hands. And the study that attempted, or really took a look at the Shawnee and Silver Creek watershed, which is in the northern portion of the city. And we chose to focus on this area not just because there was data available there, but because there's also a high um, amount of vacant lots. And so, you know, if the price is right, we're going to get back a lot of money. We can turn these 
empty lots into green space, and so it makes sense to just focus here. So when we're figuring out how to measure return on investment, the researchers wanted to be thorough, and so we're not just looking at the initial return that we would get back, but future returns after a 35-year investment period. So in order to get that kind of measurement, we took into account four different scenarios, current precipitation and land use, future precipitation and land use, current precipitation with green infrastructure, and future precipitation with green infrastructure. And by calculating what we would project damages to be in each of these scenarios, we can make comparisons across them and actually measure the value of green infrastructure in each case. We also looked at six different flood events, so, or recurrence intervals. So those are your two, your five, 10, 25, 50, and 100 year floods. And just a little sidebar, when I say a 100 year flood, this isn't a flood that happens every 100 years. It's a flood that has a 1% chance of happening every year. So you can have three years where each one has a 100 year flood just to explain that because <laughs> I think it's confusing. Um, anyway, so we took those four scenarios and those six flood events. And so for each, for each flood event, we looked at what the damages would be incurred for every parcel that was inside that watershed at each climate and land use scenario. So we ran this HAZUS user-defined facilities analysis 24 times, it's magic, because I didn't, I will be, disclaimer, I did not do this analysis, but this is how it was done. And so the results are actually quite striking. So if we're looking at current precipitation and land use, we saw $78,000 in damage just in one 100 year flood. And with climate change, we would expect the damage is to go up to almost a million dollars in just 35 years. But with green infrastructure, we could cut that down 40% initially and then 47% in just 35 years. This is huge. That's nearly chopping it in half. But it is, you know, compelling as I tried to make this chart, you know, it animates nicely. It's really not that interesting. No one cares. So. <laughs> That's why we made a visualization for it. Um, so once again, this is the user-centered design process, but it's nice and it's cyclical, cyclical as this looks. Um, our actual process looked something closer to that. So just so you know, there were plenty of times where we had to backtrack or we skipped steps and then it wasn't a perfect implementation and I don't want anybody up there to think it was perfect but I think that there were definitely some things we learned along the way that hopefully you guys will find valuable. So step number one, plan. So the goal in the first stage of development is really to define what your goal is for your project and your strategy moving forward. And in order to do that, the key is to know thy user and really, this is going to help you turn a general idea into more of a strategy by considering first who's going to be using your product and what they know and what they want your product to do. And then the really key thing for us at least was to also think about what are your users alternatives? If we don't use this, what are they going to do? The answer is simple. They're going to download 24 shape files put them in ArcGIS and sit there and toggle the layers on and off and try to make some assumptions based on that. And so our goal was to give them a better way to look at that data. So our general idea we started out with was show the report's findings on a map, but by thinking about how our user, who our users are and what the alternatives would be, we really were able to focus that more strategically and we want to instead enable data exploration and coordinated visualization. Basically what I mean by this is we want to make more than just a map. We want to allow people to view this data in multiple formats and really give them that whole data viz experience. So after you kind of decide what you want your product to do, you can start to think about 
how you want to make it look. And this is actually my wireframe I made on sometime in the first week of the project. Though I will admit, I did have to Photoshop it because there were all these really incriminating looking coffee stains all over the piece of paper. That's <laughs> why <laughs> so it's so white now. <laughs> um, and then, so after a couple of iterations of these wireframes, you can start to build prototypes and then a functional prototype. The first one of these that we made, I'm going to show you, it's here. Um, and I'm just going to give you a walkthrough of what it can actually do. Uh, no. Okay, so each of these circles on the map is a place where, oh no. All right. Cool. <laughs> so we have our basic leaflet based map, and we've got some D3 circles on it. Each one of these circles corresponds with a property where we would expect there to be damage given current precipitation and land use and a 100 year flood. Along the bottom, we see this bar chart, and this is also showing the same data, but in a different fashion. So each bar corresponds with a circle on the map, and if you mouse over either of them, you can kind of find where its pair is and how, like, ex I think it's especially useful when mousing over the circles because you can kind of make some assumptions like, oh, this is the biggest property that has damage here. So we also can click on any of these and we pull up a map or a chart that shows exactly how this particular property experiences data throughout the data set. Um, no. And then, so like I said, we're looking right now at current precipitation and land use. But if we want to select a different scenario, we see all the, the circles change size and the bars also get either shorter or taller and then rearrange themselves. And the same thing happens if we change the severity of the flood. It's kind of fun to watch, I think. Um, we're also able to change how we're measuring damages. Right now we're looking at the percent damage, but we can also choose to look at it in building losses in terms of dollars. And we're even able to change how we assign our color values. So right now we're using a color scale that's based off of Jenks natural breaks. We can also, if we want, we can apply, apply a different algorithm to how these colors are assigned. This is standard deviation, quantile, oh, Jenks again, equal interval, and really assign different m meanings to what the differences in color represent. Furthermore, if we had for some reason a particular value that we were looking or interested in really um, honing in on, we can actually take these bars, which represent the, the breaking points, and actually define our own custom color scale. Uh oh. We can even look at the data in a third format instead of the map or this data distribution chart. We can actually just click here and look at a histogram and you'll notice that the color, met, or the color scale here matches the one there. We can also bring in some other just overlay layers and change the base map. But really it's just meant to highlight the data itself and um, really let you drill into it, because I think it's an interesting data set. So, that, what? Does each bar represent an address? Yeah, it's every parcel, so we actually went through when they were doing the analysis, and they digitized the building footprints, and then they took those centroids of those building footprints, and each one of those actually got put into that hazardous analysis. So. So yeah, this would correspond with this property and you can see how exactly how much damage is like here. This would be $8,470 in damage. All right. So after building that as a just a functional prototype, I'm pretty happy with how it turned out. It can do some cool stuff. It's got really nice D3 transitions, pretty colors. 
but it's not about me. So the next phase of this cycle, we moved into doing some research and how users felt about it. So in November of last year, I actually went to Toledo and I presented that same rendition of the project in a very similar demo to the one that I just gave you. And no. And then I was able to ask for feedback from them. This is a green infrastructure workshop that where we gave this demo and so all the people in the audience are kind of key stakeholders for they're deciding what their next step is after we found out the value of green infrastructure, what to do next. And so I asked for feedback, like, what, what do you think of this? Would this be useful at all? And I guess I didn't get the responses I, I thought I would. Like, this person does the basic layout of the application seem logical. Would you make any changes? Yes. <laughs> and any additional comments, suggestions, or questions? Develop a way to, ha to have the public understand it. This is me. <laughs> so we got into this actually long discussion of what could we do to, how could we make this more useful? And this is really kind of their list of demands. They wanted a legend, fair, I can give you a legend, and the ability to export the data and they also felt that it needed separate basic and advanced functionality. Because even though they didn't say this outright, they were really overwhelmed, especially by that data distribution chart. And what that gets us into is this design step. So now I have to figure out a way to meet their needs more effectively. And this is really the basic paradigm that was driving that whole issue that they were having was that the utility here was too high for a basic user, someone who wasn't as close to the data as I was or they were to understand it. Because I forgot to mention this on the last slide. The reason they wanted the public to understand it was because they were interested in using it as an outreach tool, which is a whole different use case than we had initially anticipated and probably why we encountered this obstacle in the first place. So in figuring out how to meet the basic user's needs, well, I looked at the application. I said, well, what can't the basic, a basic user handle? Not that. They probably don't want to change the color scale. I don't think they want a histogram. And they probably don't need to look at multiple attributes. So basically, this whole bottom half of the screen we can just get rid of. And we can just take a really straightforward approach and how about we just come up with two different modes. We can just do basic and advanced, parse it out like that. And this is what that looked like. So here's the legend. So now you can tell what the colors mean. Um, and we also, in addition to giving the modes, this is the basic mode I'm going to start out with, but I'm going to talk about the other changes that are in this. Um, I guess we would call this almost a beta version of the tool. This was made about two weeks before the project was over with. Um, <laughs> I have a third demo that came out of the last two weeks. Um, so we've updated the map tiles. We're using this nice black and white stamen tiles that make the colors pop more. We've added more stylized controls with the hope that they would help highlight what data is on the map. Um, we have some additional display layers. We can turn on different kinds of base maps. I've given them the export capabilities that they asked for, but I'm going to cover these in the third demo. And so, OK, this is just showing a basic user exactly what we identified as being basic tasks. But then if I switch into analyze mode, which I decided is a nicer way of putting advanced, um, we do get the data distribution chart, as well as some other tools up on this menu bar. Um, mostly comes in this, this statistics panel. So the idea with the statistics panel was to explicitly state, all right, so what we're looking at now is for scenario four, future precipitation with green infrastructure. And then I can scroll down here and be like, oh, OK, 
What's the mean damage? 11%. And then maybe I could look up here and see what current precipitation with green infrastructure is. Oh, it's 10%. And this is really, at some point in all of this scrolling, I realized that um, next slide, that this isn't working. This approach, while we were parsing things out and making it more approachable, we were running into some major sticking points. First off, after working on this strategy for several months, I realized that there were a lot of issues with using a mode switch. The first of which is that we're relying on the user a lot. What if I'm a basic user, but I think I'm advanced because I'm overestimating my capabilities and I see this bar chart and I just leave the page immediately because I don't know what's going on. Or what if I never see it because it's at the bottom of this really long panel we have here? Or what if I just get it wrong? It doesn't, it's relying on the user too much and I shouldn't have, I feel like it was a mistake to put that much trust in the user or have the, I was letting the user experience depend on their ability to assess their own use case. I will explain what that means more, hopefully. <laughs> um, and then the third problem was this single menu display, as I mentioned before. Like, as I was showing when I was doing the demo, it really defies the whole purpose of this statistics panel if I have to constantly scroll up and down just to make evaluations about what's different between the scenarios. So this wasn't really working for me, and so I had to adapt. And so here's where it comes time to make the changes and the things that I didn't do right the first time. So again, so th what this is supposed to represent is each of the note cards is some functionality in the interface. This right now would be looking at the advanced view. We have a really long column right there. And if I flip this into basic mode, maybe, we see that I'm not really doing anything different. I'm just hiding things that I don't think a basic, a basic user can handle. Honestly, that whole toggle switch was really just flipping a couple of CSS classes on and off to just make them disappear. Really, a mode switch isn't designed to do that. Mode should be two really distinct functions that you're either doing something or you're not. The same process is going on in both basic and advanced, but in basic, we're just making assumptions that the user can't handle certain aspects of our interface, so we're hiding them from them instead of actually assessing why they can't understand what's going on and actually fixing the interface itself. So. The next step was, well, this didn't work. We shouldn't do this moving forward. What if we grouped the functions by what they actually do? So these guys on the right here are all ways that you set up what data is shown on the map. And then the map and the data distribution chart are ways that I can look at the data. The legend is kind of somewhere in between because it's explaining what's going on over here. And then right here, are the tools that we would use to actually analyze what's going on in the other parts or export them to different parts of the, or in a link or print them. And right away, this looks a lot nicer than this. Much more approachable, I mean. <laughs> and furthermore, what this allows us to do by breaking that gigantic menu into two different ones is to actually use the space in our interface to actually reinforce the functional hierarchy. What I mean is we're taking the physical space of the screen and we're saying, okay, your data controls are over here and all the tools you can use are over here. And doing it this way, we can actually create a, a natural flow through the website, which is attempting to be represented here. You can set your data, you can calibrate it, you can look at the map, you can analyze that with the tools, then you can adjust your data and flow through this in a natural way. Furthermore, having your data controls up here is giving your user a logical starting point. 
they can land on the page and know kind of how to move around or at least start to figure out your functionality. Um, and so this is the final version. I'm going to close this out for now. And what it looked like after all of that redesign work. So now we have our data controls up in the upper left hand corner of the screen. And normally I'm not one to put things on the map because I want to keep that nice and clean. It makes things easier if we're going from mobile to desktop. But that didn't work for us. And I think that we're using good use of screen space by having these collapsible controls, which are actually highlighting exactly what we're looking at by, like, you can still read it while they're shut, but you only see the choice that's on the map right now. And if we look over in the side of the menu, we see that instead of just lumping all of these different panels in one long list, we've kind of grouped them together in these more structured lists with the headings, display, analyze, and down there it says export, which we're just saying outright. This is what you do with these things here, which is really helpful if you've never seen this before. Um, furthermore, we have these little eye icons, so if you do get confused, you can click here and we have this, this is just like a custom tour thing I built. It's really just four D3 blocks that are picking out elements and then looking at how far from the top, the bottom, and the right of the screen they are and just resizing them accordingly. And it, I think it works really nice to spotlight exactly what's going on in the interface. And it's nice to have them in multiple places because if our users are anything like me and you land on that website and it says, do you want to take the tour? I'm usually just like, no, I'm going to try and figure this out on my own first. And so now we can, by placing them in multiple places in the interface, you can just do the tour for the things that are, you're having problems with. Um, oh, I was going to show you guys the export options. So before we did, we moved into that second version of the map, we um, also built it to run on Node. So that kind of enabled us to do stuff like this. Or let me make it look more different. All right, we'll do satellite. Of course, that's what's open. <laughs> <laughs> OMG. <laughs> and it works, I swear. It's connecting. There it goes. Boom. And it pulls up the map exactly as I had it on the other version. Um, and what we're really doing here is at any given point, there's all these global, va global variables floating around my code that are saying exactly what the map looks like now. And so basically by exporting it as a link, we're just encoding all those global variables into that long link address. When the user or the other person that you might want to share this with clicks on it, node is just decoding them and then handing it off to the browser to show you exactly what you want to see. There's also print, but I would show you that, but it doesn't really work without a printer. Um, oh, right under this analyze panel, which my favorite part, you can see now while you're changing the different um, flood events and climate and land use scenarios. And so this makes it much easier to make comparisons across, I think. Um, and so the thinking was that just by putting, creating a switch, I mean, this wasn't that innovative of a solution, but by just giving the user control of whether to turn something on or off, 
That's all they have to do if they don't want to look at it, is just turn it off. Um, let me think if there's anything else, because I talked really fast. <laughs> oh, we also added, or really tried to make the pop-ups better. Um, instead of just giving you those static numbers that corresponded with the current data set that you had selected, you can also now click on these dots and actually pull up the actual dollar amount and percent damage from any point in the map. And then click show current if you want to actually show the current value. Um, so I think that wraps up this part of the tour. And after we did this, we made all these big changes the next step and the final step in any cycle through this user-centered design process is to measure and really assess how that's all working out for the user. And we did this through some user observation studies where you basically, you sit behind someone and you creepily peer over their shoulder and you're like, look at a five-year flood event and you see how they try to accomplish that. Um, and we had a pretty good idea based on those that things had worked out and people were able to use this. But for you guys today, I thought it would be more interesting if I had some actual figures to show you. So I did the best user, oh, and this is what you're asking during the measure today, just did it work? That's sometimes a hard question to ask yourself. So I bought the best um, usability study a budget of zero dollars can buy. I harassed my friends via Google Forms to do some basic tasks. I really identified three very low level tasks and I wanted to see, can you do this? And basically just looking for red flags and the results. Oh, and then we're comparing these to a benchmark success rate. So if we were doing real usability studies, this is what you would be looking at to be like, oh, it's a pass, I got a 70, good enough. Like that's pretty much a, an average for even people who do UI and UX, is anywhere between 75 to 80, 70 to 80. Um, so the first thing we asked them was to determine in which climate and land use scenario flood damages were the largest. So for this one, they just had to toggle between each of those four scenarios and either look at the statistic panel or take an educated guess. And 94% of them were able to do that. Yes. Um, next, they had to determine how many parcels were expected to be inundated by a five-year flood. This one was by far the, far, hard, by far the hardest. And because they had to look at two different things and look at how and actually get the numbers or refer to that, bar, that line chart, which I forgot to show you. And 76 could do this. And my explanations for why they didn't do as good in this category are I had some ambiguous wording and I'm calling trolling on some of my participants because some of those answers were not very logical. <laughs> and um, that's really great. I'm being very um, kind to my users. That was really <laughs> great UX. Um, and then Third, I asked them what color a circle would correspond with a property that was 25% damaged. The idea being, can you read the legend? And 88% were able to do that, which gives us an overall score of 86% of our questions were asked correct or answered correctly. Not bad. And again, I'm not really, we weren't putting any weight in this kind of a survey. I just wanted to come here and if I'm talking to people who are actually doing a lot of development that I could be like, yeah, it works, instead of just being like, yeah, well, I watched a couple of my coworkers and they could figure things out and they're not the most tech savvy people. <laughs> um, so some conclusions from this whole process is that UX is important. Um, I hope that everybody here realizes that, especially today, UX is driving your sales or people just using your product. Again, our product is free. I'm not actually trying to sell anything. I just want people to actually want to engage with it. And user experience is 
almost more important than it actually working in a lot of ways. Um, <laughs> you should know thy user, and don't just know who they are. Really, know thy user. Be able to think for them. Don't look to them for, to tell you how to solve their problems or even identify what their problems are. Because that's how we kind of got lost into this whole let's do two separate modes thing. Um, and that's not what doing user experience engineering is about. We're trying to solve the problems and actually facilitate them to have a good experience without their help. Seek input and seek it often. I know I told you not to listen to your user, but be able to watch them. Or you can look for things that they're having issues with, but don't look to them for solutions, I guess is what I'm saying here. And abandon approaches that aren't working. The longer that you wait to make changes in your design, the harder it is. Um, but don't let that stop you from making changes, even late in development. Those, the second and the third demo I did, those were 10 days apart. Those were the most hellish 10 days of my life, but I think that the results were good, so I'm glad I made those changes because I knew better than to do what I was doing anyway. And think before you code, because that's how you can avoid rebuilding your interface in 10 days. Um, and the more you can take your user and make them a part of your design process, the easier all of this can become. So again, this is me, I'm Lizzie Slabinski. This is my email, feel free to contact me. Obviously, I'll be here at the conference. So if you have any questions or follow me on Twitter. And these are the libraries this was all built in. Are there any questions? <laughs> in the back. It was a mix, actually. Um, and it, I don't mean my friends. I mean, I sent this out um, kind of throughout the mapping community in Madison. I had it sent to the university. You know, had a couple of my friends and coworkers actually operate list services, sent it out to people who were in cartography classes. Um, and that was actually really beneficial to actually talk to people. I know that that's not necessarily, um, it's not necessarily a representative sample of who I need to use this, but people who are actually in a design field are going to give you better feedback than someone who's in municipal water management because that's how I got the develop a way to get for the user to understand it. And I'm not saying in general, but Given the format of the survey, it wasn't really good research anyway, but actually by talking to people who could interpret design, I guess, better, I thought that it would be more useful with them, if that makes sense. Um, anyone else? How important is measure? You have that as the last thing there, and you seem to be important. I mean, is it important to actually capture mouse clips? Um, I think that it, I, I think that it is um, important to measure, and I guess maybe I should have explained it this way. I saw, once saw this graph that was like, you can do three different things. You can have a good usability study, you can have a thorough one, or you can have a cheap one. You can't do all three. And it's like, that's not really like, I, I guess I disagree. There are ways that you can, my typical, the way that I approach usability as I'm developing is I go home and I harass my roommates. Hey, look at what I made today. Can you figure out how to do this? Or I talk to my friends and I show them what I'm looking at. Just anybody who's not as close to the code as you are, I think it's useful. Or if you really wanna like, figure out if someone can use what you're building, send it to your mom and ask her to do it. Do, give it to people that don't know how, how to use technical things. But is it important to capture mouse clicks? Maybe, maybe if this was like a billion dollar project, I would want to do that, but 
it really wasn't that. We work for a nonprofit, and that would just never be in the budget for us to actually do like a thorough mouse click study. No, um, no, the, um, so green and gray, gray would be just now. Um, so the amount of flood damages, Oh, like if they could tell the. Well, I'm just wondering if having two panels, one getting the green infrastructure and the other Well, then we'd have to split the screen, really, to look at it. And, you know, we actually did think about that to make the comparisons across the scenarios more to better facilitate those. I actually didn't cover this because we actually ended up holding off on implementing this part of the project. So I kind of, I didn't talk about this compare view option. So if we turn this on, you see that the data distribution chart inverse, inverts partially. And we have brown, was a terrible color choice. <laughs> and um, so basically, Anything that's right side up right now is a property that we're, we would expect the damages to be, this is, it's really confusing even to explain. So basically what we were doing is for every property, we're subtracting the current precipitation with green infrastructure from the current precipitation with land, uh, with normal land use. And so the ones that are right side up are ones that where we would expect it to be lower in green infrastructure. See, I think that I should have made this chart opposite. But the other problem that we ran into with this is really hard to tell, but some of the bars are darker than other ones. And we actually realized something that we never saw in actually doing the GIS analysis was that even though we saw a 47% reduction in flood damages, we would have assumed that 40%, those 47% were the same parcels. But because of minute differences that were a result of the actual hazards analysis, that there was only 50% of the parcels that were actually in both scenarios. So it was predicting different parcels were actually damaged in one and the other. So we actually ended up removing this from the code and um, just kind of saving it. We're hoping, I mentioned earlier that this study was also done in Duluth and we're hoping to revisit this because Duluth has led us to believe that this might be something they wanna build too. And yeah, we never really, I guess we decided that we would rather put something out there that is straightforward than something that we're not sure that if it can work or not. And so at least with the statistics panel, you do have to do a little bit of subtraction or evaluate two different options. But we felt like that was just the better way to go at this point. Did I answer your question kind of? I mean, I was just wondering if you, know, you have the green panel on the bottom and the other one at the top Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a lot of different ways to look at it. <laughs> In the back. So you mentioned 70 to 80% uh, score for measurement process being good. Now, is there anything over that going to signify that you either did a really good job or is it more so you didn't really ask the right questions? Um, well, I mean, that's what I, the 70 to 80% was just kind of this threshold that you're looking at and depends which one, depending on how important it is that a user is going to complete a task. Something like this 
probably doesn't need like a 100%. You can figure it out. <laughs> no one's life is depending on the fact they can read this map. Um, but no, I don't think that. I think. Exactly. If that's what you need. Um, for this, I don't think. I mean, I think that it works. Do I think that it's perfect? No. There's other things that I wish that I could revisit here. But, I mean, I feel like that about all of my maps. It will never be perfect. Um, I don't know. It could be either. I don't think that those numbers were really demonstrating a true random sample of people who were using it. But I think... It was good to confirm. At least we didn't get any red flags. I mean, there wasn't any question that we asked. And oh my goodness, no one can figure out how to read the legend. And even in developing the survey, it was really useful to go and look at, as a framework to go through our application and click through and be like, well, I'm going to ask them to do this. And it was a really easy way for me to be like, well, they might be concerned about this label that's here. I should probably add that and make it really clear because I don't want my friends to get the questions wrong because then I'm going to be angry with them. <laughs> um, anybody else? What size is your team? 16 people run the entire process. Um, the entire nonprofit. This was just me. I keep saying we and I interchangeably, and that's because I don't want to take complete credit for it. And I'm schizophrenic. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, but because I mean, I do work within science services. To, like we have a weekly meeting where they basically, the three other people in science services, go through and pick apart what I've done that week. But I was really the only person coding this map. Yep. So I'm sure your project's not unique and you went through several iterations of the different mm -hmm. interfaces. So we all go through that. What makes us make bad decisions at the beginning? Why, why can't we just... Things change, things I think. And I mean, I don't... Even in this oversimplified circle, you know, what they teach you in school process, they have, you know, an adapt thing in there because no one gets it right the first time and it really does come back to that whole circle thing and magic. It's really hard to separate from um, a project from the perspective that you're looking at it from how a user sees it because you're so attached to it and at least for me this was like I was working on this for five months you know it's really hard for me I would watch my boyfriend try and use this on his iPad, and I would just be like, why aren't you in advanced mode? Can't you figure that out yet? <laughs> I show you this every day when I come home from work. Um, <laughs> poor guy. <laughs> but yeah, I, I really don't know, and I think that for us, at least, it also came back to that the user group changed, and we got this whole set of outreach requests that we weren't even anticipating. This project literally started as just, my, <laughs> my boss actually asked me to make this at ArcGIS Online first, and then I did it in D3 and Leaflet, and so then I was allowed to keep doing that. <laughs> it was supposed to be like a quick and dirty thing that was just on the internet, so if people were interested, it would accompany the report. So our user group completely changed midway through, and so we had to reassess our whole goal structure for taking on this approach as an application. And I think it would have been better if we really went back to square one instead of just kind of backtracking or solutioneering as we went along. But. We learned from our mistakes, I guess. Or I, <laughs> not we. <laughs> Anybody else? Well, thank you for listening. Um, I hope that that was useful. This whole process for me, I learned a lot about this, and I know that I got kind of lost midway through the whole process of developing this application. I kind of forgot things that I learned in cartography as an undergraduate geography student. And I think it was good to actually kind of re 
revisit those kind of principles of things that I had learned and then forgotten, and then now I had to relearn them. So that's why I did this. So thank you guys. That's it.